Let's be seated. Welcome address. The chairman of CAN and PFN in a color zone, distinguished pastors, geos, evangelists and lady evangelists, elders and church workers that are in this gathering. You are all welcome to this conference in Jesus' name. I mentioned pastors, evangelists, lady evangelists, elders, church workers. Because we are co-laborers with Jesus in his vineyard. And I believe also that we are branches that must bear fruit so that we will not be taken away or we will not be cut down. That's what the scripture says. Want to know this? In John chapter 15, let's read through. Not only that, we've been bearing fruit, but we want to bear more. And as branches, we need to be purged so that we can bear more fruit. Hence, our gathering together today. More than this, we are called and we are chosen to bear fruit. And I pray we will bear fruit. Because since we have been called and we have been chosen to bear fruit, we cannot afford to disappoint him that called us. And I pray we will not disappoint him in Jesus' name. Art Cry International, just as we have been seeing the banners around and probably the invitation given unto us, they are the ones that organize this conference today. Art Cry International is a non governmental organization and has formed the United States of America maybe many years ago. But we felt their presence in Nigeria in 2001. And the brains behind this organization are Pastor Ron Ives and his wife, Mrs. Kala Ives. Pastor, both of them are pastors. That's Pastor Ron Ives and Pastor Mrs. Kala Ives. Pastor Ives is with us this morning and they have branches all over the world okay. including Africa and the African branch or branches have been supervised from no other country than Nigeria so let's clap for Jesus <laughs> Amen so once again I welcome everybody to this conference this morning in Jesus name Amen. I will now hand over to the African director now to continue with other items in the program thank you and God bless you thank you sir Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Shall we shout hallelujah? Amen. The Lord is good. We give thanks unto the name of the Lord this morning. For the grace given unto us. And opportunity we have to gather here. 
At this Congress, Awaken the Shepherd. I want to appreciate the name of the Lord for giving us this great opportunity. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I want to thank the Lord on behalf of this church, the pastor in church, for giving us this opportunity to come here to share with everyone that is here this morning. I thank God for the life of the leaders in this church. May the Lord be with this church, the pastors, the associates, the workers, and the entire members in the name of Jesus. The grace of God will continue with you in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Amen. And I want to thank God on behalf of we, at Cry Africa, the board members that are with me here this morning. I want you to know them one by one. By the grace of God, here with me this morning is Pastor Clement Alube, one of the board, board of directors. Amen. Following him is Pastor Jare Babashola. Amen. The man of God, beside him, is Pastor Kule Kayode. Amen. 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 And to God be the glory, one of our workers in this church is part of us as board member in person of Sister Bosse Akinyemi. Amen. Praise the Lord. We bless the name of the Lord. Since last week that these people of God has come We have been holding program here and there, and they do not tire. Every day program, we bless the name of the Lord on their behalf. Amen. Amen. Yes, you meet this morning, man of the world. The world is with him. Because he is living in the world and the world is living in him. You meet me this morning as I'm introducing unto you one of our speakers is Pastor Kick Parker. God bless you. You meet with me this morning. The Lord is using him mightily is an elder and uh, the controller of Sunday school in his church and that is Bra George Thompson <laughs> praise the Lord amen. amen to God be the glory this man of God that I want to introduce to the glory of God. His wife came to Nigeria first time, 2001. Since then, we have been in contact with one another. But when it is time 
the husband also follow. Praise the Lord. Since then, they have been coming to Nigeria. Coming and coming, returning to Nigeria, and Nigeria has become the second home. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. To God be the glory. This man of God is man of his war with integrity. Committed to the war in his hand. He has very great vision and is, is following the vision as the Lord leads. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. The first time he came, he came with the vision of seven mountains. Seven mountains of influence. The second time was the message of the glorious church. And today, the Lord is going to use him also. He is the founder of VOH. That is Vessel of Honor. It's a Bible school. By the grace of God, yesterday was the end of second semester, which is a year. We were rejoicing together. And is the founder of Potter's House Fellowship Center in Michigan. And our wife, the co-founder of ACI Art Cry International. ACI. Amen. This morning, with vision of awaken the shepherd. If you believe with me, I want to believe that the church is sleeping. Have you? Is church not sleeping? The church is a sleeping giant. But the power of the Lord is very much available this morning to wake the church, to wake the sleeping pastors, sleeping workers. We are sleeping, but the word of God, through his servant that is sent him all over the world, awaken the shepherd. Here you meet the man of God, Pastor Ronald Hives. <laughs> Amen. Before he will be coming to the pulpit, the choir want to render their song Awaken the Shepherd. God bless you. Lord, begin our more. God, 
us once again Oh Lord begin again Lord begin again Lord begin among us once again Oh Lord begin again Lord begin again Lord begin among us once again Oh Lord begin again Lord begin again, Lord begin among us once again. To move so ji, to move so ji, Oluwa to move so ji, to move so ji, to move so ji, Oluwa to move so ji. To move so ji, to move so ji, all so ji, to move so ji, to move so ji, all to move so ji. Let your 
your sons and daughters speak the word of prophecy send those dreams and visions reveal the secret of your To be. There's going to be a great revival in our land. There's going to be a great awakening. And everyone who calls on Jesus, they will be saved. Lord, pour out your spirit on all the nations of the world. Let them see your glory. Let them fall in reverent call. Show your mighty power. Shake the heavens and the earth. Lord, the world is waiting. Let creation see the coming of your day. There's going to be a great awakening. There's going to be. There's going to be a great revival in our land. There's going to be. There's going to be a great awakening. And everyone who calls on Jesus, they will be saved. There's going to be. There's going to be a great awakening. There's going to be. There's going to be a great If you love the Lord, shout a louder hallelujah. hallelujah. I think this is a very wonderful uh, uh, message from the choir. Please let's put our hands together for the choir. The song says there's going to be a great awakening. A great awakening in our land. Before I bring the man of God this morning, I'd like you to cry to God from where you are and say, Lord, let this great awakening start from me Oluwa Jeki sojin lai Jeku bere lati no me open your mouth and cry to God pray sincerely 
Let it start from me. Let it start from me. I don't want to come here in vain. Let it start from me. Only one of you will be a lesson. They could better let you know me. 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 From me. From within me. Let it start from within me. Cry to God. This is why you are here. God wants to awaken us. He wants to revive us as ministers of the gospel, as preachers, as pastors. He wants to turn our life around. Cry to God and say, Lord, let this revival start from me. Let this revival start from me. Oluwajaki is soji iku bere. Let you know me. Thirty seconds more. Speak to God. Thirty seconds more. Let it start from me. Let it start from within me. I must not leave this place the same. Something good must happen to me this morning. My life must be transformed today. There must be a restoration, oh Lord, in my life this morning. Something good must happen in my life this morning. I mustn't go back the same way I came this morning. So follow me. Only the company of Shell and I am in a row. Me or Bodo Pada Bimoshewa. I am me Bodo name for what dollar are you? Oh, the sorrow now. Why don't you open your mouth and pray to God? Thank you, Father. Lord, we give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Say your louder, Amen. And so shall it be in the name of the Father, Amen. and of the Son, Amen. and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. Are you so happy to be in the presence of God this morning? Wave your hands to me. I am so happy to be in the presence of God this morning. Give the Lord a beautiful smile. I'm so happy to be in the presence of God this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the best place to be. Because it is in his presence that we can have fullness of joy. May that joy be our portion this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, one day we bought about fell at the ball. It was so in the Yoruba. A jackal lost your kibay. What to she to? She befoa. Somebody will be there to interpret for us. A jackal she been missing. Go to the pay. A pay. Russia Loro. Ma Bonewa Jua. Praise the Lord. Once again, we want to appreciate all the ministers. A DT affiche to Ben, we pay Kishakoba, Nimbaya, Bainbo, Shuman, Shaman, International, I want Americans, Oshe, Shake, Yamali, Bodada. So, but I want to Bodada one bay, one less shall I hear from one. A boat you want so slang, you want ya to see Tiwai. Praise God. So, so that uh, Ali, you are Dada. God bless you. Praise God. Are you ready now? Are you ready this morning? Praise God. Amen. The Bible says we should give honor to woman who is due. Amen. We are going to give honor to God and the bearer of his word as we rise to our feet. And I bring to us this morning the international president of Heart Cry International. Please join me as we welcome Pastor Ron Hives. If you want to put your hands together, put it together very well. I heard you talk about it. Uh, 
Thank you so much. You can be seated. I want to extend our appreciation to Pastor for opening this beautiful church building facility. We are honored to be here today. I bring greetings from my wife, Pastor Carla, who spoke here last year at your church. She told me all about you, so I know everything there is to know about you already. <laughs> she sends her greetings. Pastor Wooley and Pastor Azuka Boboadi, also I bring greetings from the states, from them to you, as well as a fellowship. It's an honor to be here today. In Michigan, right now, there is snow on the ground, and it is like 17 degrees Fahrenheit. It is very cold. The water is frozen. You can walk on top of it. Like Jesus, walking on water. But it's frozen, thick with ice. So this has been a change of weather for us. It is a little warmer in Nigeria. <laughs> Very hot, yes. Before I introduce our first speaker this morning, and then I will speak second, and then our third speaker, Pastor Kirk, will be our last speaker for today. Not only has my wife come to Nigeria multiple times, multiple times. Two of our three children have been in Nigeria. Our youngest came in 2004, was here, and just her heart was so opened to the Nigerian people and to people in this region. Our son Caleb has been here multiple times teaching on discipleship and then our oldest son who is a school teacher in one of our large cities he will be here at some point as a five-year-old boy he had a vision from Jesus that he would share the gospel in Africa and he's not been here yet so there will come a day that he will come with me or with someone Pastor Carl and I both will be back in August as we begin uh, the second year of VOH and launch the first year of VOH again for new students. And also we will do another children's crusade. We will do the Word Club graduation. And we are excited, we're committed to partner with you to see Jesus glorified in this beautiful nation of Nigeria. I was weeping on the side during one of the songs of the choir, such an anointing upon you. Such an anointing. I was weeping, just thanking God for the honor and the privilege that he has given me to go to different parts of the world and one of them to be here, to be able to know brothers and sisters like you we have a church amen we have a church back home and we have every year an international banquet and last year we had 24 nations that were represented there we had we have several people from Nigeria in our church and they have had it so much amen I say this about Nigerians they have covered the earth. They have covered the earth. God has sent people from your nation all over the world to preach the gospel. To preach the gospel. God has his hand upon this nation. And I am in full agreement with our song. There will be revival in the land. God is awakening his church he's awakening each and every one of us because we are the church amen amen, amen. amen. 
So it's an honor to be here today. And I want to introduce our first speaker to you, Brother George Thompson. Good morning. It's an honor to be with you today. Uh, what, what a place of worship. I was really moved, so thank you. Uh, what a heart for the Lord. Thank you so much for that. Um, what, what I'd like to preach out of today is the book of Genesis, the story of Joseph. So if you'll go with me to Genesis chapter 37 uh, and just follow along with me. <clears throat> So Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan, where his father had lived as a foreigner. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flock. He worked for his half-brothers and sons of his father, wives, Beulah and Zepla. But Joseph reported to his father some bad things his brother were doing. Jacob loved Joseph more than any other children because Joseph had been born to him in an old age. One day, Jacob had a special gift for Joseph, a beautiful robe, but his brothers hated it. Joseph, because their father loved him more than the rest of Because his bro brothers hated it because, his, because of their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night Joseph had a dream and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Too close? Closer or farther? Closer, okay. Uh, where was I? Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying bundles of grain. Suddenly, one, suddenly my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers respond, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more. Now, I want you to look at the heart here. The heart of God, and in the midst of that, the heart of man. When jealousy grips our heart, it overtakes us and separates us from God. And, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. Hatred coming into the heart, darkness coming into the heart, which is producing jealousy. And there's be, become a separation, not only between the blood brothers, but the separation between God and the brothers. And I'm not saying it's easy to listen to your youngest brother tell you what's going to happen, but at the same time, it convicts my own heart because I have that same jealous heart at times. I have that same thought at times that separates me from the Lord and, and it convicts me today. As we continue on with this story, the plan is to get rid of Joseph. Have you ever noticed in your own life when you don't like something, you want to get rid of it? <laughs> you, you, you don't want it anymore, so you want to get rid of it? And, and I just, I, you know, again, my, my heart is convicted because the brothers here, I feel for what they're doing, what they're going through, but at the same time, I also see the hand of the Lord in the midst of all this. And so, it, it's just a, such a tough place to be, but once again, I'm reminded of waiting on the Lord. So as the story goes, we dive in here, 
and they come up with a plan to get rid of Joseph. First they're talking about throwing him in a dry cistern and leaving him for dead. But one of the brothers has a conviction, talks him into that, says let's throw him in the dry cistern and then his mind, he's going to come back and get him that night. <laughs> But the other brothers come up with a second plan and they sell him, sell him into slavery. Now look at the deception here, they continue to lie. So they sell their brother into slavery but now they've got to come up with another lie to tell their father what's happened to him. More darkness, more separation from God. So the plan is, when they sold him, they took his rope so no one would know, dip it in an animal's blood, show the father, and now you have a father mourning for a son that they can't control. Now look at the heart. Look what the heart's done because of control and manipulation. It's broke a father's heart. It's broke our father's heart. <laughs> and it's sold a brother into slavery. L look, look at all the darkness in the midst of that. So the more you step into darkness, the more darkness consumes you. But God had a plan. <laughs> God had a plan here. And he always comes after his people, doesn't he? Amen? Amen. So we learn that Joseph is sold into slavery. So in chapter 39, Joseph is in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar was an Egyptian officer for Pharaoh. <clears throat> but I want you to hear verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. Everybody else has left Joseph, but the Lord was with Joseph. And that so moves me because when you feel like you've been betrayed, when you feel like you've been hurt and sold out, God doesn't leave you. He is right there. And I want you to hear the heart of God. It, it, it's just so amazing to me. Evil has been done but yet there's a plan for every heart in this story. So as time goes on, Potiphar raises Joseph up, but by the hand of God. So he raises him up, he's working, he's doing what's right, he's fulfilling what God has called him to do. He's doing what Potiphar has asked him to do. And what happens? More darkness comes at him. Potiphar's wife comes at him and she wants him to sleep with her. So he battles that for quite some time. And I'm sure it wasn't easy. He's, I don't know how old he is at this time, but when we first started the story, he was 17, so he's a young man. He understands what's going on, but he also has a Spirit of God upon him. So it happens several times. Finally, the third time, she grabs his cloak. It falls on the floor. She accuses him, and he gets thrown into prison. He's done everything right, and he looks like he's being punished for everything. Can you relate to that in your own life? You're doing everything right, you're walking with the Lord, but things are just not going your way. But God has a plan. He always has a plan. So he's thrown into prison.
little windy up here. So in chapter 40, we find out uh, Joseph interprets some dreams here. So sometime later, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Oh, thank you. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm good. So anyway, sometime later, Pharaoh's cupbearer and chief baker offended their royal master. Be Pharaoh became angry with his two officials and put them in prison where Joseph was in the palace of the captain of the guards. They remained in prison for quite some time and the captain guard assigned them to Joseph who looked after them. Once again, he's in prison, but he's got authority. See that? God's got a plan. He's in prison, but he's given authority. And I just so love that. And so, as the story goes on, the, the, both the chief baker and the cupbearer have dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his first dream. In my dreams, he said, I saw a grapevine in front of me. The vine had three branches and began to bud and blossom. And soon it produced clusters of grape. And I saw holding Pharaoh's wine cup in my hand. So I took the clusters of grapes and squeezed the juice into the cup. Then I placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. So this is Joseph speaking. This is what the dream means, Joseph said. The three branches represent three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift you up, restore your position as a chief cupbearer. Now listen to the heart of Joseph here. And please remember me and do me favor when the things go well for you. Mention me to Pharaoh so he might let me out of this place, for I was kidnapped, kidnapped from my homeland of the Hebrews, and now I am in prison, but I've done nothing to deserve it. Then the chief baker saw that Joseph had given the first dream such a positive interpretation, he said to Joseph, I had a dream too. In my dream there were three baskets of white pastries stacked on my head. The top basket contained all kinds of pastries for Pharaoh, but the birds came and ate them from the basket on his head. This is what the dream means, Joseph said. The three baskets are representative of three days. Three days from now, Pharaoh will lift you up and impale your body on a pole then the birds will come and peck away your flesh. Now wouldn't you like to interpret that dream to somebody? Three days they've got to live and you're going to be pecked to death by a bunch of birds? I believe I'd have, I believe I'd have stepped that one. But let, let's just let somebody else interpret that. I don't want to tell this guy he's dying. But he didn't. He was obedient. So anyway, as time goes on, two years pass, two full years pass. Now Pharaoh's had a dream. And so they call, no one, he calls the magician, the magician can't interpret it. No one can interpret it, he's trying to figure it out. So the cupbearer remembers Joseph in prison interpreting his dreams. And so they call him up.
So Pharaoh asked Joseph to interpret these dreams. And he talks about a famine, seven years prepare, then seven years of famine. And what's he do at that point? But he raises Joseph up. He takes the finger off his own hand, places it on Joseph's hand, puts the robe on him, and immediately he's the CEO, he's royalty for Pharaoh. God's favor has moved him there. But the thing I want you to see here is God had a plan the whole time, but it took two years to finish the plan. <laughs> it doesn't always happen overnight. Have you ever prayed, 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 and prayed, but God still hadn't answered? Don't you know jo Joseph was praying? Don't you know he was asking? I mean, that had to have been a horrible place where he was hanging out. But again, God had a plan, and he's always trying to shape the heart of man. So once again, I, I want to talk about the heart as I close here. As the story goes, his brothers get hungry, so dad sends them to Egypt to get some food. And the heart of Joseph, which you would be, I mean your own brothers have sold you into slavery, and now you're looking at them face to face, they don't recognize you. So you're going to mess with them a little bit, wouldn't you? I mean, you, I, I would. And so he, he's really questioning him and trying to find out about how the family is and everything. And he, he's just really giving it to him. And he actually throws them in prison for three days. And then finally gives them an option if they'll bring their younger brother back. then he'll take away the punishment and release. He keeps one brother in prison and they'll release the brother back. Now I don't know the lapse between the time they went back, but on the way, they open up their bags and what do they see? And they only had their grain uh, packed with food or their bags packed with food but the money that they brought to buy it was replenished but where did their heart go they felt like they had done something wrong and they missed the blessing <laughs> they missed the blessing and so once again when you're in that place when you've done wrong when you've been consumed by darkness your mind always goes that direction. So they come back, they get, they finally convince their father to take Benjamin and go back. And by this time, Joseph has got a different heart. It doesn't say in here exactly what, how the God prepared his heart, but I just got to believe that if you've been separated from your family for many years, there'd be a grieving in your heart. There's also something in, in Joseph's heart here for the Lord that, that I really love is he's a servant. And as his brothers come back, he, re, he reveals his identity. But if you remember in the story, one thing, one thing that really jumps out to me is where Joseph burst out in tears and he has to turn away from his brothers. 
He's longed for them so long in his heart. He burst out in tears. So in chapter 45, verse 3, it says, I am Joseph, he said to the brothers. Is my father still alive? His brothers were speechless. <laughs> now what do you do if you're the brother that sold your brother into slavery and he's standing before you? It's an aha moment, is it not? I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery. But don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It, it was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. God had a plan and a heart of God recognizes God's plan. And can you imagine receiving that being the heart that sold your own flesh and blood into slavery and now you're hearing it was God's plan and trying to take that into your heart and realize <laughs> that God had a plan of that. That's overwhelming to me. But God's plan always works out. And Joseph got everything back. And his family was restored and his dad saw him again. God always finishes his plan. So brothers and sisters today, I, I want you to hear when things don't go your way, when you feel anger in your heart, ask yourself what's going on here. Why, why am I feeling this way? Don't let the devil take you down a road you don't want to go. Always ask the Lord, there's something here you're trying to show me. There's something here you are trying to show me. I'd like to close in prayer if I could, please. Lord Jesus, it is an honor to serve you. It is an honor to be your slave. I thank you for the picture that continues in my mind of Nigeria and a servant's heart. I thank you for the gifts that we have heard and we have seen come out of the people. Your people. I thank you for this time where we can reflect on your word draw close to you and feel your presence. I thank you for your spirit that is leading us that you left to be our friend, to fill us. I thank you, Father, that you've always got a plan for our lives. You never forsake us or leave us. Lord, we love you and we praise you and may God be the glory. Amen. Hallelujah. God has a plan for every one of your lives. No weapon formed against you will ever prosper. God works all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Amen? Amen? Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. You got to guard your heart. Joseph guarded his heart. 
He didn't let his heart get poisoned because it didn't work the way he wanted it to work. He continued to trust God and God's purpose prevailed. God's purpose prevailed. Amen? Amen. The word out of the heart springs the issues of life. The word issues means boundaries. The boundaries of your life are determined by what you have in your heart. By what you allow to rule in your heart. It sets the boundaries of your life. If you have bitterness in your heart, you're shrinking your life. If you allow faith, if you allow the love of God, if you allow the joy of God, if you allow the vision of God to rule in your heart, it extends your boundaries. Praise God. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You're going to speak what you have in your heart. I like to tell people, your mouth is going to tell on you. Your mouth is going to reveal to others what you got in your heart. If you're speaking unbelief, if you're speaking fear, it's in your heart. I thank God that my mouth tells on me. Because then I can know what's in my heart. And I can change what's in my heart. I can repent. I can ch think differently. I can begin to put in the Word of God in that area so that my heart believes what God says. Amen? Amen. We are blessed to be here today. Just as God had a vision for Joseph's life, every one of you as leaders, as a follower of Jesus, God has a purpose for you. God was building a young man. God was developing Joseph to be the ruler, to be the prime minister, if we can, of the greatest nation on the earth at that time, Egypt. God was preparing him. God was preparing him. All of us, God is at work in us, preparing us, shaping us, conforming us to the image of Jesus. Today, I want to share with you about being presence-led leaders. Leaders who are led by the presence of God. And we're going to take some time. We're going to compare the life of Saul, King Saul, and the life of King David. And we're going to see how Saul was led by many things, but not the presence. And how David was a presence-led leader. In Exodus chapter 33, when Moses speaks to, the, to God, he says, God, come and show me your way. And God says to him, I will be with you and my presence will go with you. Moses says this, he says, unless your presence go, we're not going to go. He was a presence-led leader. You know the story in Exodus. Whenever the cloud moved, who moved? The people of God moved. They followed the presence. When the fire moved at night, they moved with the presence. And when the presence stopped, they, they rebuilt the tabernacle there because the presence was in the Holy of Holies. The presence at times would stay a day and they would have to break down the tabernacle and carry it to the next place. There were times that the presence would stay there for a month or two months. They had to learn not to move unless the presence of God moved. Leaders, you need to learn how to be led by the Spirit. The Bible says in Romans 8.14 that as many as are the sons of God, they are led by the Spirit of God. As many as are the sons of God, they are led by the Spirit of God. The word son is an interesting word in the Greek language. It's the word huas. And it means this, a son is one who is reflecting the character of the father. Who's reflecting the character of the father. 
So God is telling us through the Apostle Paul, he is saying the ones who reflect the character of the Father are those who are led by the Spirit of God. Another word in the New Testament that is used for child is the word technon. It's different than huas. That word means you're a child by birth. How many know when you birth a child, you're their father or their mother? But what God is saying, God wants us to mature where we're not led by our emotions in childish ways, but we are led by the Spirit of God. That we are leaders who are led by the Spirit of God. We're mature ones. We're mature ones. So please today, let's walk together. I'm going to give you three things that led the life of Saul. And then, I will break them down one by one. But first, I want to give you the three things that led Saul's life. And that at a time led my life. And at a time leads, has led many leaders life. God wants us to be led by his presence. The first thing we see that leads Saul is impatience. Impatience. I am P-A-T-I-E-N-C-E. Pastor, can I get a felt a marker for the board? Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you, thank you. Aha. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. I'm going to write these on the board for you. This is crucial. Saul lost the kingdom. He lost his destiny because he was impatient. Because he was impatient. We are going to see this in Scripture in just a moment. Thank you, my brother. Impatience. The black, black is better. Okay. I... Better? Better? Aha. My wife has much better penmanship. <laughs> I'm, I don't know if she did it when she was here, but she will take a piece of paper and she'll be cutting as she's talking. Did she do that when she was here? And when she's done, she has created something. When I cut things, you would never know what I was trying to create. <laughs> we see number one impatience number two emotions Saul was led by emotions not the presence of God we are here today to help you young leaders if you get this truth we are sharing today it will change your trajectory, the direction of your life. You will miss going through obstacles, hitting ditches, falling into places that God doesn't intend you to go. If you will get this message, it will strengthen you as a leader and help you fulfill what God has for your life. So number two, emotions. Number three, circumstances circumstances Saul was led by impatience he was led by emotions. He was led 
by circumstances. And now I would like to have you turn with me to 1 Samuel. That's the portion of Scripture we will spend our time together in mostly. 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel 13. First Samuel 13 verse 5 through 14 can I erase this okay Please feel free if I'm going too fast to just slow me down. We are here because we want to share understanding. We want you to get this. We want you to understand the truths from God's Word. We are going to all the notes that I will be using today, we will give to Pastor Sampson who will get them to your church and to other leaders that are here so you can have a hard copy of the notes that I'm speaking from because we want you to get the understanding okay God bless and we will try to do the other notes as well but definitely these ones because I already have these okay first Samuel 13 5 through 14 the story goes Samuel has spoken to Saul and says to Saul wait seven days for me when I come and then I will make the offering after seven days let's read this portion together first Samuel 13 Hallelujah. Verse number, let's start at verse number seven. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel but Samuel did not come to Gilgal and the people were scattered from him so Saul said bring a burnt offering and a peace offerings here to me and he offered the burnt offerings offering now what happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him and Samuel said what have you done Saul said when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within days within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash then I said the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal and I have not made supplication to the Lord therefore I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering if you underline in your Bibles that is a verse to underline therefore I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering verse 13 and Samuel said to Saul you have done foolishly you have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God which he commanded you for now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever but now your kingdom shall not continue the Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart and the Lord has commanded him 
to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Saul was given direction. He was to wait seven days for Samuel to come to make the offering. He began to feel the pressure because people were leaving him. He began to feel pressure because the circumstances seemed to be getting worse. It says that he felt compelled to make the sacrifice. Let me share with you what this means. He forced himself. Some of your translations might even translate it that way. But it says that he forced himself. That tells me he knew he was feeling conviction, but because of the pressure and impatience, he did it anyways. He didn't wait for the fulfillment of the word. He was going to make it happen himself. He ends up losing the kingdom, his destiny, because of impatience. Too many leaders are led by impatience. The Bible says in Hebrews 6 that through pay, faith and patience they inherit the promises of God. Not just faith, but through faith in what? Faith in what? Patience. Through faith in patience they inherit the promises of God. Leaders, we want to be led by the presence of God, not by impatience, not through impatience. Hebrews talks about not being impatient. Abraham waited on the Lord. When he was impatient, what happened? They ended up having Ishmael because he wasn't willing to wait for God to bring forth the promise. And then he had Ishmael, who was a difficulty the rest of his life. First Peter chapter 15, 10 through 30. Excuse me, First Samuel. We see in this portion again impatience driving the life of Saul. Impatience driving his life. Let's look at David. How many remember the story? David was anointed the king. He began, he was a serving, he was serving Saul, and then Saul began to chase David. Remember the story in Samuel? Yes. And then Saul has to relieve himself, and he goes into a cave. And who's in the cave? David. David is in the cave. Saul comes into the cave. David has the opportunity to what? Kill Saul. Those around him says, God set this up, kill him. But what does David do? He says, I will be led by the Lord. When the Lord wants me king, it will be the Lord that establishes me as king. It won't come from my own hand. He was patient. He was a leader who was not led by impatience, trying to make it happen himself. He was one who said, I will wait till the Lord moves, then I will walk with the Lord and move with the Lord. We see a leader led by impatience. We see a leader led by the presence of God. We want to be presence-led leaders. 
The second thing that we see lead the life of Saul is emotions. Emotions. I want you to understand emotions are not bad. God created every one of us with emotions. Jesus showed emotions. He wept. He felt sorrow. He felt joy. Jesus felt emotions, but he was not led by his emotions. I only do the things I see the Father doing. He was led by the presence of God. Emotions are given to us by God so we can experience life, but they are not to lead us. I am not to take emotions and put it as the driver of my car. Emotions are not to drive my life. I am to be a leader who is led and controlled by the presence of God. Now let's look at some stories here of the life of Saul. But before we do, let me make a statement and I'm going to write this statement on the board. Write down the verse, Proverbs 25, 28. Listen to what this verse says. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. I want to read it out of the English Standard Version, the ESV, Proverbs 25, 28. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. If you allow your life to be controlled by your emotions, you are like an unwalled city and you are prey for the enemy. That's what this verse is saying. If we are led by our emotions, they're controlling us. They're dictating our actions. They're dictating our responses. We are like an unwalled city that's going to be destroyed. Here's the quote I want you to write down. An uncontrolled tongue An uncontrolled tongue and emotions An uncontrolled tongue and emotions will lead to a life of instability and destruction I will say this again an uncontrolled tongue and emotions will lead to instability and destruction I want you to write that down 
And now, once you have that, I want to show you this from the life of Saul. Someone who is controlled by their emotions are like this. One day they're happy, the next day they're angry. Next day they're peaceful, the next day they're full of fear. If you ride your emotions, you will never become the leader God has called you to become. God is looking for leaders who follow His presence, who are controlled and led by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. Now look at 1 Samuel chapter 18. We will read some of the verses, not all of them, but you will be able to have the notes and the verses written down. Where I'm coming from, the text is 1 Samuel 18, verse 6 through 16. 1 Samuel 18, 6 through 16. Everybody get this? Uh -huh. We will look at this account. What happens here is the women begin to sing. Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And we'll pick it up at verse number eight. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands. And to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul. And he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand as at other times but there was a spear in Saul's hand and Saul cast the spear for he said I will pin David to the wall but David escaped his presence twice now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him but had departed from Saul Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all his ways. And the Lord was with him. Therefore when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. What do we see in the life of Saul in this text? Anger, fear, there are what, envy. He envies what God has placed on David's life. He's letting emotions control him to the point he throws a spear at someone who is faithfully serving him leaders if you allow envy and jealousy emotions to control your heart you will hold down other leaders you will not let them rise up and shine because you're being controlled by your emotions you will hinder the movement of the church of God because of envy controlling us Saul here, he tries to kill David because he's controlled by emotions. By emotions. Another text, 1 Samuel chapter 20. 
We're talking about uncontrolled emotions will lead to instability and destruction. And destruction. First Samuel chapter 20. I want you to see what happens here. Verse 30. Through 34. This is what the word of the Lord says. First Samuel 20. 30 through 34. Then Saul's anger was aroused against Jonathan. And he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, you shall not be established, nor your kingdom. Now therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said to him, Why should he be killed? What has he done? Then Saul cast a spear at him to kill him, by which Jonathan knew that it was determined by his father to kill David. Look at where uncontrolled emotions has carried this man. He tried to kill his faithful servant, David. Now his own son. He is willing to kill his own son because of unchecked, uncontrolled emotions. It's leading to destruction. It's leading to destruction. He has allowed his emotions to control him and to lead him instead of the presence of God. Now I want you to see the instability because of uncontrolled emotions. 1 Samuel 24. We've talked about the, the incident where Saul goes into the cave and then David has the opportunity to kill him and he doesn't. So then after Saul leaves the cave, David from up on the mountain speaks to Saul. And Saul then says, you are my faithful servant. You've, be, you've, you've behaved better than I have. I will not chase you anymore. Is, the, is the, the central thought there. He's saying, I repent of my behavior. I am not going to do this anymore. How many know it wasn't long and he was doing it again? There's instability. He's writing what he's feeling. He's writing his emotions. He feels remorse because of David's kindness to him. But the moment the remorse changes, anger comes back. And he begins to chase David again. There's instability. If you are an unstable leader, your followers will quit following you at some point. If you are an unstable leader, those following you will not be able to continue to follow you because they don't know how you're going to respond. God is looking for presence-led leaders. Now, 1 Samuel 26, the same thing happens. Saul is in another place. David goes over, takes his spear. You know the story. The next day, Saul recognizes his spear is gone, and David has it. At that point, he says, David, I'm sorry for what I've done. I won't do this anymore. Was that the truth? For that moment, the emotion of remorse again was in his heart. But quickly, the emotion of anger took over and began to lead him again. Instability. 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 Emotions are not bad 
but they are not to lead our life. Be angry and sin not, Ephesians 4. So anger is not sin itself. It's if I let it lead my actions to where I hurt people, strike out at others, gossip about others, speak evil of others, then it becomes sin. Emotions are not to lead us as leaders. Let's look at King David. First Samuel chapter 23. First Samuel 23. I want to add one more piece for you on the instability with, with Saul. In 1 Samuel 28, you can put this alongside of 1 Samuel 26 on the instability of Saul. But in that chapter, you will see that Saul said, put an end to all mediums in the land. He said they could not do witchcraft, they could not be engaged in trying to call up the dead. He put an end to all mediums in the land. Where do we see this man at the end of his life? You brothers know, you know, don't you, sir? Where is Paul seeking counsel at the end of his life? At a medium. Instability. He takes them and kicks them out of the land and then because of riding emotions he ends up going to one to try to get direction to have them call back Samuel do you see what emotions will do to your life if you let them control you they will lead to destruction and they will lead to instability David's life first Samuel 23 David, a presence-led leader. Verse number 1 of 1 Samuel 23. Then they told David, saying, Look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah, and they are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. What does David do? When he hears the report, does he instantly go? What does he do? He looks to God. He wants to be led by the presence, by God. He wants to be led by by God now look at what happens but David's men said to him look we are afraid here in Judah how much more than if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines so what does David's men say we don't want to go we don't want to go what do we see David do verse 4 then David inquired of the Lord once again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Now it happened when Abiathar, the son of Amalek, fled to David at Keilah, that he went down with an ephod in his hand. What do we see here? We see David inquires of the Lord. He goes, he delivers the people of Keilah. Then he stays there with them. Now let's continue with the story in verse 10. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah 
to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver you. So David and his men, about 600, arose and departed from Keilah and went wherever they could go. How many know that if you delivered people at your risk, at your expense, you would expect them to show you the same kindness? David hears that Saul is coming and he asks the Lord will these people that I've delivered turn me over to Saul or will they protect me and God says they're gonna turn you over anybody else here have to deal with some emotion at that point somebody you have delivered now willing to betray you did David let emotion control him? No. He followed the Lord and just left. He was a presence-led leader. He was not led by his emotions. 1 Samuel chapter 30. David and his men come back to the city of Ziglag. And the Amalekites have come in and have taken all their wives, their children, and all of their goods. Let me tell you, if somebody comes and takes Pastor Carla, something's going to happen inside of me. There are going to be emotions that rise up in me. If someone takes one of my children, emotion is going to rise up in me. We see then, they weep, and what does David's men want to do? They want to stone him. They're angry at David. They're letting their emotions control them. But what does David do? The Bible says he strengthens himself in the Lord. Why? Because he was, his emotions were running in him. And he wasn't going to let them control him. So he needed to get with God and strengthen himself in the Lord and bring his emotions into check. Because emotions would have said go. Emotions would have said run. But he inquires, he strengthens himself in the Lord. Then he inquires of the Lord. Why? Because he does not want to be led by emotion. And he asked the Lord, should we go? And the Lord said, yes, go. You will recover all. Do you see this? Do you see the difference between Saul, who's led by impatience and emotions, lost the kingdom, to King David, who was led by the presence of God, who a seed from him will sit on a throne that will last forever and his name is Jesus. His life was filled with favor. He was not controlled by his emotions. I have pastored now 35 years. I am 40 years old, not really, <laughs> I'm 65 years old. So I have been involved in ministry since 25, so I guess that's 40 years, pastoring 35. And I've ran into many people who have told me, I cannot control my emotions. I don't have the ability to control my emotions. My family has always been that way. My dad was that way. 
my mother was that way I had this happen in my life so now these emotions I can't control them I'm here to declare to you as a leader that is a lie that is a lie and I'm going to show you a scripture that tells me why it is a lie how many believe that God's Word is the truth God's Word is the truth amen his word is the truth go with me to 2nd Timothy chapter 1 2nd Timothy chapter 1 can I tell you as a young man I wish I had the opportunity you have today to sit with a group of believers and to hear a message about not being impatient to hear a message about not letting my emotions control me there was a time in my life where for two years I had pain in my chest I fainted passed out three times because of stress because of the emotion of fear I was praying one day and God spoke to me and he said Ron there is one Lord there is one Lord quit living to please other people quit living to be successful and begin living following my presence begin living for me the audience of one the audience of one this message will change the years ahead for you don't be impatient trying to force something wait on God wait on God Saul didn't wait for Samuel what happened he lost the kingdom we need to learn to wait until the Lord troubles the water we need to learn to wait until the Lord moves then we move with the presence of God we don't move and then beg God to follow us he's not the follower we are the follower he's not following us we're following him he is the leader God is looking for presence led leaders second Timothy chapter 1 6 through 7 I can't control my emotions I declare today that is a lie verse number six therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands the gift that's spoken of here is the Holy Spirit Timothy received the Holy Spirit as Paul laid hands on him and Paul is challenging him stir up God inside of you encourage yourself in the Lord it's the same as what David was doing David encouraged himself in the Lord stir up God inside of you so that God is controlling you verse number six or seven for God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of self-control your translation made me say sound mind if you look that up it's the same thing as self-control so God has given me the spirit of self-control so that I don't have to be controlled by emotions a man who does not have self-control a woman who does not have self-control is like an unwalled city 
Proverbs 25, 28. You have the ability, by the help of the Holy Spirit, to control emotion so that it doesn't lead your life. So that it doesn't lead your life. Stir up the Holy Spirit inside of you so that the Holy Spirit is the one controlling us, guiding us, leading us, directing our life. Now, this is one of the things I felt the Lord drop into my heart. When I experience an emotion to ask why, to look past the emotion to what's causing the emotion. Why am I angry right now? Not just I don't want to be angry, but why am I angry? What is the lie that's causing me to be angry? Give you an example. I'm angry when I feel out of control. So I see anger in my life, but when I look behind the anger, I see it's because I don't feel like I have control of situations. What's the answer to that? Trust God. I don't have control, but I trust that He's in control. I look at the root. I go behind the emotion. Why am I fearful? Why am I angry? And then when I find the cause, I bring God's truth to it. And it allows me then to not let that emotion control my life. So we see here, Saul was led, one, by impatience, two, by emotions. Are you okay with me going a little longer? Okay. I know we have a break set up here as well. I want to deal with the third thing that led Saul's life. One, impatience. Two, emotions. We see David totally different. David was patient. He waited on the Lord. David did not let emotions control him, but he was led by the presence of God. He responded to God. The third thing that we see in Saul's life was that he was led by circumstances. He was led by circumstances. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, 9 through, or 19 through 21. 1 Samuel 9, 19 through 21. 1 Samuel 9, 19 through 21. We see that when Samuel called Saul, Saul said, I'm from the smallest tribe in Israel. I'm from Benjamin. How can I be the king? We see that when Saul, Samuel comes to anoint him, where do we find De, uh, Saul? He's hiding in the equipment. Why? Because he's letting his past circumstances determine whether he can fulfill his calling and destiny. He saw himself as small, coming from a small place, so he could fulfill the destiny that God had for him. I want you to get this. Some of us don't step into what God has for us because of our past, because of the circumstances of our past. Maybe a failure, maybe where I came from, maybe my family lineage, and I let those circumstances determine whether I let God lead me into what He has for my life. We're controlled and led by past circumstances. David, Samuel comes to Jesse, call in your sons. I'm going to anoint one of them. Who didn't he call in? Who didn't get called in when Samuel was there? David. He was left out in the field. He seemed too insignificant to even bring in. How many are glad that God knows where you are? Hallelujah. 
God knew there's a son in the field and he's the one others might belittle him others might say you're insignificant where you've come from your past doesn't let you step into what God has for you but I'm here to tell you your past circumstances do not have to determine your destiny somebody needs to say hallelujah in this house your circumstances from your past do not have to control your destiny I've shared in every place we've been I was an alcoholic before I received Jesus Christ there was brokenness in my life others would say you won't amount to anything but I'm here to tell you, there came a day when Jesus, my Savior, came and grabbed a hold of my life. And He changed it. He transformed it. He began to open doors people said could never be opened. That's why this morning, as I stand over there, I am weeping. Because I realize it has been God in my life. If we will let God lead us, you can't eye has not seen or have we been able to imagine what God has prepared for those who love him God's destiny for your life is bigger than you or else it's not God if you can do it it's not a God destiny it's it would be you personally doing it God steps us into things we can't do because we need to him in the midst of it to see it done God has called you with a purpose, with destiny. Don't let your past circumstances control you. David comes to where Goliath is. And we'll talk more about this in a moment. But he comes and his brother Eliab is there. What does Eliab say to David? What are you doing here? Go take care of those few sheep. What's he doing? He's belittling David. He's wanting David to feel small. He's wanting David to feel insignificant. But David didn't allow that to control him. That did not determine his purpose or his destiny. He didn't let the opinions of others or the words of others Brothers and sisters, whatever God has spoken to you, He watches over His Word, and He will be faithful to perform it. God will bring to pass. God will do it. His brother tries to belittle him. Can I tell you, we've been talking about worldview. We've been talking about search for significance. Where do we find our identity? In the Bible school. Can I tell you that person next to you is an image bearer of God? Is an image bearer of God? You bear the image of God. You have God inside of you. There is no limit to what you can do as you follow the presence of God in the will of God. I can't do my will, but if God has spoken something, He is in me to see it done. You are image bearers of God. You have value. You have purpose. You have a significance. And David got the revelation. He didn't let others or his circumstances determine what he believed God could do with his life. Hallelujah. Come on, leaders. Hallelujah. We see Saul controlled by his, not only his past circumstances, but his present circumstances. Let's go back to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, chapter 13. Pastor Samson, is there a time we want to quit for break? Is there a time that we want to quit for break? Okay, I'm going to go about 15 more minutes, we do a break and then we come back, okay. Hallelujah. First Samuel chapter 13 we read some of this story earlier but I want to highlight verse 6 
when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger. Verse number 11. And Samuel said, what have you done, Samuel? What have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered. What is Saul letting control what he does? What he's seeing? The natural circumstances are controlling him, and that's what leads him to make the offering. He's led by impatience, but we also see him here led by the circumstances. How many know that sometimes God shows up at the last hour? <laughs> there were two men in prison who were singing hymns and worshiping God, and at the midnight hour, the prison began to shake and the doors opened. We see here in Saul, he allowed the circumstances, though he had the word of the Lord, God had said, wait seven days for Samuel. He had the word, but he let the circumstances cause him to disobey what God said to him. He was controlled by his circumstances, not the presence of the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 15. This, excuse me, let's go to 1452. 1452. We see here in 1452. Now there was a fierce war with the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him for himself. How did Saul choose those who would join to him? By what he naturally saw. Can I tell you as a leader, if you select leaders based on natural sight, you're going to select some wrong leaders. You're going to select some wrong leaders. You need to select by the Spirit as the Spirit of God directs, not by just what you see with the natural eye. Saul selected by what he saw. If somebody looks strong, I want him. He chose by natural circumstances. Now in chapter 17, this is a the story of Goliath, we've all probably heard this story from our childhood. Verse Samuel 17. Verse number 11. When Saul and Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Go to verses 23 through 27. Then he talked with them. There was a champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man fled from him and were de dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said to David, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father house exemption from taxes in Israel. What do we see here? What is controlling Israel and what is controlling Saul? What they see, their circumstances, the words of this giant causes these people to be hiding behind a hill, not fulfilling the purpose of God because they're controlled by their circumstances. And along comes this young shepherd boy. And he says to him, have you, you seen the giant? Haven't you heard his words? 
How many know that David saw the giant? David heard the words, but David's response is totally different. Why? Because he's not led by his circumstances, but he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of the living God? David sees different. David has another perspective. He said, when the lion came after me and when the bear came after me, God slayed them and he'll take down this giant. David sees what God is doing. He's not controlled by circumstances. Come on, brothers and sisters. He doesn't let circumstances cause him to disobey what God is calling him to do. Praise be to Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. We talked about 1 Samuel 30. What took place there? The circumstances were bad when he came back to Ziglag. Yet, that did not deter David. David headed on. In Genesis 12, God speaks to a man named Abram. He says, Abram, go to a place that you don't know. Go to a place you don't know. How many know that circumstances could have said, I'm comfortable here. I don't want to go where I don't know. But what does Abram do? He follows the Lord. He follows the presence of God and doesn't allow circumstances to control him. The circumstances do not control his life. How many know that when Abraham was almost a hundred and Miss Sarah was 90, she was past the time of bearing children. How many know the circumstances were saying, you can't fulfill what God has spoken. The word will never come to pass. Your wife is 90. She is no longer able to bear children. And Abram, Abram, you're an old man. What does God do? He says to Abram, he says, I want you to change your name. I want you no longer to call yourself Abram, an exalted one, but I want you to call yourself Abraham, the father of a multitude. What's happening here? God's telling him to step out of his circumstances and to begin to say what's going to happen before it happens. Can you imagine the first time someone comes up to Abraham and he's almost 100 and they say, Abraham. Or they hear Sarah say to him, Abraham. They had to walk off to the side and start to say, that is impossible. The circumstances are too much against them. He was not controlled by his circumstances. I see so many leaders stuck because they're unwilling to step past what they can see with their natural eye. We have got to quit letting impatience, emotions, and circumstances lead us. I cultivate an intimacy with Jesus, and I follow him. When he speaks, I'm led by his presence. Wherever he goes, I follow, I follow, I follow, out of the intimacy that I have with him. Amen. 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 I'm going to close with a verse and then I will pray. But in Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus is in the wilderness and the enemy is tempting him. But Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. How do we live? 
by hearing God and following his word. You will not experience the life of God without hearing his word and following his word. We live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Hallelujah. Do you know that 12 men who were disciples of Jesus, who in the upper room became 120, who then became 3,000, who then added 5,000, turned the world upside down? But it started with 12 who said, we're going to follow the presence, follow what Jesus has for us, and we're going to see what he wants to do. Do you realize we have more than 12 here today? Just think, if the passion of every one of our hearts was to be a presence-led leader, and we were open to say, Jesus, wherever you lead, I'm going to follow. I think there would be an awakening in the land. I think we would see a revival in the land. You have the potential to take these lessons, this revelation, apply it to your life, teach others, and to see change happen. Because God has a future and a hope for good for each and every one of us. Amen. God bless you. Let me pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you, God, that you said we are those who don't grow up in darkness. And God, I pray today in this room in Jesus' name. I pray today, God, these leaders learn how to be led by the presence of God in Jesus' name. God, I pray today that you break off the control of impatience off of these leaders in Jesus' name. If you're here today and impatience has led you, talk to the Lord, repent of it, ask God to forgive you. Say, God, I turn from being impatient. I am going to learn to wait on you and let you lead me. Talk to God about that right now. You and God, talk to, talk to God about that. That you're going to be a leader not led by impatience. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. God, I repent of being impatient. God, I repent of trying in my own strength. God, I repent of it. I turn from it today. And I make a declaration in this room that I will be led by the presence of God. I will be a man who waits on the Lord, who seeks the counsel of the Most High, who is led by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Thank you today, Father. I'm going to ask you here now to look at our emotions leading your life. Have you let emotions control you? That they're what are making decisions for you instead of the, the Lord and the presence of the Lord. Talk to God about that. Repent if you've allowed your emotions to control you. Just talk to God about it. Let go of the emotions. Say, God, I want to be led by the presence, led by the Spirit of God. Father, I break off anger off my brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. I break off fear in Jesus' name. We will not be led by fear. We will not be controlled by fear. We'll be controlled by the love of God, by the Spirit of God. God has not given us a spirit of fear but of love, of power, and of self-control. Our emotions will not rule us, but the Spirit of the living God will rule our life. We will be led by His presence, led by the Holy Spirit, controlled by the mind of God, by the will of God, and the purpose of God. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. God, I thank you. I thank you, Father. If you've let if you've let circumstances control you today talk to God about it say I've let that control me I've let lack I've let where I came from I let what somebody said to me control my destiny no more no more today 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 there is a shift in the spirit I will be led by the presence of God the Word of God will lead me I will live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. I will not be controlled by emotion, by circumstances. No weapon formed against me will ever prosper. No mountain will stand in the way of what God has called me to walk in. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Work in every life. Thank you for it, Father. Thank you for it, Father. Flood every heart with faith. Fill faith, 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 confidence, trust in God, 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 trust in God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Korabahata lehare shoho Shorabahata rarabaka. Rikolo ho ho rema. We are the people of God. We are the people of the Most High. We are the sons and daughters of the living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise your name, Lord. Bless this body of believers, Lord. Strengthen them with might. Encourage their hearts today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to clap, put your hands together for Jesus very well. What a wonderful moment in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you blessed you are here this morning? I, do you want to really bless God for what God is doing in your life, in my life this afternoon? Have you been blessed? Did you really think the word of God has come to you? Wave your hands to him and appreciate him again. What a wonderful moment. Glory to Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we worship. Take your seat. God bless you. Praise God. Amen. Spirit, I mean, sorry, presence-led leaders. Presence-led leaders. By the special grace of God, we are going to be leaders that are led by the presence of God. We will not be led by impatience we will not be led by emotions and will not be led by circumstances in jesus name pastor ron after this meeting in the school of the spirit the lord is awarding us with msc that is double uh, second degree award msc can i tell you that is master of situations and circumstances <laughs> glory to jesus amen from today we are masters over situations and circumstances never again are we going to be controlled by emotion by circumstances and by impatient somebody say i am blessed amen. hallelujah amen I think right now we want to go for short break. Okay. We want to go for short break. It's going to be about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. It's going to be about 10 minutes. Now, if you don't want to go, if you don't want to go, if the choir can just give a worship song to sink down this message. If you want to go and ease yourself, you are free to go. But even in the long run, let's listen to wonderful as many as we have. Ten minutes take care. It's okay. Yes, yes, we want to yes. If you want to give us worship, solemn worship song. If you want to go out to ease yourself, you are free. But as that is going on, let the worship song be going on. As you are sitting, if you don't want to go out, just sit down, meditate in the spirit. And allow the message to sink. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, move in
above him there is no other Jesus is a Jesus. Let's celebrate Jesus. Let's celebrate him. Let's celebrate him. Let's celebrate him. He's worthy to receive all glory. He alone is worthy to receive all praises. Thank you very much, choir. God bless you. Thank you very much. Now, those of us who are outside, please let's come in. <laughs> 